Okay, now the provocation is on the table. Or it is sort of in the air. And I'm very happy, or oh, I'm very much looking forward to the following debate now, because we are going to focus on those theses now. We will check whether they can withstand criticism. To do so, I would like to ask our panelists to join us here on stage. It is Professor Armin Krishnan and it is Daniel Stratman. So please join me here on stage. Let me briefly introduce the two gentlemen to my left. I would like to introduce Daniel Stadtmann. No, sorry. Professor Amin Krishnan. Until recently, he was visiting lecturer at the University of Texas, El Paso. He now moved to North Carolina, where he teaches foreign and security policy. And he is an author of three books that investigate new practices of current warfare. Amongst other issues, he deals with targeted killing and drone wars in the context of the war on terror. So he is sort of predestined to say a few words about our issue here. Cordial welcome to you. And then... I would like to welcome Professor Daniel Stratman of the Department of Philosophy at the University in Haifa. He specializes in ethics, legal philosophy, and Jewish philosophy. He also published numerous books and articles on war and ethics, and he is a member of the committee that sets up the ethical guidelines for the Israeli army. And that was also one of the reasons why we invited him. Against various prejudices, I know hardly any other society that so intensively deals with issues of military integrity, uh, military ethics, sorry, sorry, like the Israeli society. And this is very remarkable in a country which uh, depends on its ability to defend itself. And I would like to welcome you to Berlin. I would now like to start in medias res. I'm not going to make a long statement here to introduce or to kick off the debate because I think that Professor Münkler provided us with enough food for thought for our debate here, especially with his provoking thesis that drones and automated remotely controlled weapons are mainly the weapons of post-heroic societies because they reduce their own vulnerability, they minimize their own losses, and they keep distance to the potential attacker. So as a consequence, they are an expression of a societal mentality which avoids or which tries to avoid risks. This could be embedded into a broader context but if I understood you correctly, you are not only describing that as a form in which those societies where the patriotic victim or the victim for class and other political religions are no longer up to date, but based on Hegel, you at least pose the question whether those modern weapons systems do not constitute ethical progress because 
they say goodbye to the mass wars that took place in the past. And that leads to a much more precise sort of surgical form of warfare. And I would like to know from you what you think about those theses. Would you like to start? Consider the strategic context of war <clears throat> before we discuss more, more the gadgets or the tools of war. So what are our objectives in war? What do we want to achieve by individually targeting people who we think pose a risk to our society? And, <clears throat> yeah, and there is also the question whether it's ethically appropriate to use lethal force for achieving those objectives. I think that the future wars will not be the high-tech, high-intensity wars where we need uh, highly sophisticated and very smart autonomous weapons in order to break uh, those very sophisticated defenses. I think the future wars will be shadow wars. And yeah, they will be conducted in, secretly, uh, in secret, and they will be conducted primarily by intelligence services and special operations forces, sometimes also using drones. We're not fighting against other heroic societies. We are fighting against uh, particular elements in those societies which we consider to be problematic or a threat. So, <clears throat> so, so that is, I think, the changed context. And I also think that <coughs> that um, we are moving towards a future of war where we can individually target our combatants and that uh, uh, certain separations are breaking down. Uh, one is the clear separation between combatants and civilians. So can we always prove that terrorists are combatants and that they deserve to be killed at any time and everywhere? And the other separation that has been traditional that is breaking down is the separation between internal and external security. So sometimes we find our enemies within our own society and then we might choose to target those people the same way we target people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or other parts of the world. So we need to be very careful in, on what kind of path we are set now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, Thank you. Um, then would I get... Okay, so... Then I would like to ask Mr. Stutman to continue the discussion. I mean, here we are talking not only about technologies, but also about practices that are not only hypothetical in Israel, but that are concretely implemented and used. For instance, targeted killings with the help of drones or guided weapons. But... I would like to ask you to comment on this attitude vis-a-vis -vis those weapons systems and embed them into a broader context. Um, okay, first maybe I need this now right now. Um, first a word about Hegel. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Hegel is always kind of fascinating and. Um, um, encourages um, thought about the zeitgeist, um, though it's always a bit speculative. And also, it's never clear how deterministic we, we, we think the picture is. So I, I think your, your um, analysis is, is very interesting. It wasn't clear to me, and this was maybe the, the question you started with, whether you, you were trying to say that because this is the kind of a zeitgeist with the, you know, the anti-heroic society, then Inevitably, this is where we stand. I'm not sure you, you, you are in, indicating that direction. If so, I think this is wrong. I think, I think we are here to discuss it because we think that we, we are free to create society, to create the norms, and so on. So 
Um, that's for Hegel. Um, regarding um, drones and target killing, so I think this came up quite clearly in the in the last um, in the previous session. I think we should keep these issues entirely separate. The issue of these new technologies, whether there's something inherently problematic with them, and the issue of targeted killing. Just to give you a sense of why the separation is, is so important. Targeted killing was carried out by Israel and other states well before anybody thought of drones. And bin Laden was killed with, you know, quite low-tech people, you know, chasing after him, um, not, not by drones and so on. So you can, you can carry out targeted killing without drones, so there's a question there on the table whether this is legitimate or not, regardless of the question of these new technologies. Secondly, there are arguments against these new technologies which have nothing to do with targeted killing. So there was, there was an argument was, which was raised in the um, earlier session uh, to the effect that there's something um, against dignity, something of indignity when you kill somebody using a human, a, a, sorry, a machine, okay? So th that would be, I mean, if you accepted this argument, which I don't, but the argument assumes that the very killing by a machine is morally wrong, regardless if it's in the context of targeted killing or in a regular old-fashioned war. You know, soldiers versus soldiers, tanks against, um, against tanks, and instead of you, a, a human being, um, firing, you have a machine there. So that argument would say that there's something wrong going on. So the arguments for and against these new technologies, and we shouldn't limit them to the context of targeted killing and, and vice versa, okay? Now, I'd be very happy to go on speaking about targeted killing if you would like me to. And if you allow me to, I mean... Next round. Fine. Um, but... Because then we would have to talk about, and this has already been raised as an issue, to what extent there is a distinction between terrorists and combatants. Can we really distinguish between those two in asymmetrical wars? This was your thesis. However, before we do so, I would like to come back to the broader scenario that was sketched already at the beginning of the conference. Now, the criticism, Mr. Munkler, of this form of high-tech warfare, automated killing systems has been everything but nostalgic. So it wasn't said, this is cowardice, Augstein, etc. No, the criticism was based on a different quality or had a different quality. It was ethically more fundamental and more political. Ethical fundamental because there is a fear of an automation of war, including all the risks that things become uncontrollable, that you cannot control things anymore, reducing the threshold when it comes to using military violence. That was also one central point of criticism, but mainly something that we call the informalization of war. So the borders between war and non-war becoming blurred between military and police, between military and intelligence services. So wars without declaration of wars of war. This seems to be the real challenge to me. Also when it comes to the embedding of military conflicts. Well, I will try to respond to the three issues that you have just raised. Now, the dissolution of the distinction between external and out, um, internal and external is a process that started already long ago. In the 1950s, Moritz Janowitz, in his fundamental military sociological study, talked about a policing of 
the war. And this policing of war should be embedded in the context of the disappearance of heroic societies, which to a great extent take away or deprive all members of the society to pay with their lives to defend their values and ideas. That was between 1890 and 1945 that this disappeared, 1918, sorry. Why that is so is a very complex issue, and I don't think that we have to discuss it here in detail. Western societies have a fundamental aversion against that. And for ethical reasons, they used this policing process. So the context of just war, Elum Justo, Elum Justo up to the Extensio Recta, is in principle a discussion of focusing on the police, the Bellum Justum principle sort of disappeared as a consequence. So those systems are embedded in a political societal development which is rather, rather temporary. Yes, boundaries between external and internal are disappearing as a consequence, but it is not because of those systems, but it started with the emergence of NGOs who as independent, non-territorial actors suddenly started to play a role. If somebody asked me what Al-Qaeda is, I would say it is an armed NGO. In the beginning, sorry. It's a non-governmental organization, unarmed, or armed rather, sorry. I mean, of course, you can say that NGO is a structure that you like, but I, as a social scientist, take a different perspective here. It is interesting that in the beginning of implementing the system of statehood, Philip in France destroyed an NGO the Templar Order, a system which was structured in a very specific way where there are men, capital, and weapons that are taken to the front to Palestine where the Crusaders acted correspondingly. You know that story from the trivial stories. The beautiful Philip wanted to get the gold of the Templars. This is how it is told. No, no, but he was a smart man. He knew that an organization which is able to generate loyalty fundamentally competes with a system of states. Now, we actually like that in principle, that states do no longer have sole loyalty. I mean, especially Germans will probably like that because they have a very critical attitude to the time where the government or the state was exactly in that role. Having said that, I believe that you have to be ready to say, okay, we are dealing with developments in which the classical boundaries that are fundamental for the order of the European legal and state system from the 15th to the 20th centuries are eroding. And this erosion has far-reaching implications. And it results in a situation where counteractors are no longer governments or states. What was the last state war? Russia against Georgia. It only took two or three days. So this actually, or Georgia against Russia rather, this is actually something which does not take place anymore or cannot take place anymore. So in a nutshell, I think that the development of those systems have just to be embedded into broad development so that we can understand them. Two last remarks. I'm not sure, Mr. Krishnan, whether it became clear that I distinguished between heroic societies and heroic communities in my speech. A German social scientist has to do that. So there is a difference between society and community. There are no heroic societies anymore, but there are heroic communities that have a totally different constitution and a totally different internal structure. You love life and we love death. 
Yeah, something like that. And as regards Hegel, well, I tried to interpret Hegel on the omnipresent Kant, the Kantians have the idea that we can tackle and cope with developments by trying to establish ethical principles and refining them intellectually. This is the credo of a follower of Kant. I think Hegel dealt with this credo here in Berlin, and he tried to say that this is a battle that can never be won. You can say that this is speculative, but... Ever since Hegel's death, there have been various empirical examples that show that Hegel was right and not Kant. I mean, I don't want to sell the whole Hegel to you, but it's just a counterposition to Kant. Last remark, Osama bin Laden. Yes, of course, infantry was used here to kill him. Troops that were deployed with helicopters and that then carried out the execution, eye-to-eye -eye sort of. It wasn't about killing bin Laden. I mean, politically speaking, he was already dead. It was about the symbolic act, and that could not be carried out clandestinely with a machine. No, that had to be executed and carried out uh, in a way that the presence of the U.S. was demonstrated. But all the sub-officials and other... I mean, here the risk of the infantry and the landing of helicopters. I mean, of course, there are very high risks involved here, and you require a lot of planning, much more logistics. Here, again, laymen talk about strategy. Experts talk about logistics. Logistics is the key to solving that problem. So you can afford that symbolically, but the rest will be done by the machines. But now I have to prompt, what is the legitimacy of this type of targeted killings? I mean, you are talking about execution here. So it comes down to executions without court proceedings and trials. It is about executions carried out on the territory of a third country. So what is the legitimacy regarding international law for those actions? It's a question to the three of you. Okay, I don't understand the war on terror to be a war at all. I think the problem should be rather phrased in terms of international law enforcement. So terrorists should be considered criminals and we should use the tools of prosecution to bring them to justice. I don't think it's a fair analogy to say that the, uh, anybody associated with a terrorist organization is a combatant and can be killed at any time, anywhere in the world. I think that's just legally wrong, and I think it's also ethically wrong. <coughs> so, so, so that was the point... I wanted to make a, a, about that. I think, uh, generally speaking, targeting individuals is a good idea, uh, especially when it comes to the new types of wars that we, we are going to fight and that we are currently fighting. And, uh, yeah, one comment about the post-heroic uh, society and the use of special operations forces. I think that special operations forces have a very bright future. They are expanding in size. They will be used more frequently than, uh, rather than less frequently. I don't think that uh, not putting your soldiers at risk is the bottom line at all, especially in shadow wars that we are fighting. So uh, soldiers continue to be expected to risk their lives, and <clears throat> yeah, the, the public wouldn't uh, care that much if they wouldn't know about it. So it is uh, known that special operations, uh, Joint Special Operations Command is operating in 120 countries of the world, and usually the public has no clue. So they are involved in a mission called Foreign Internal Defense or in counterterrorism operations. I'm sure many of them lose their lives uh, on those operations, but we don't hear about it. So I think uh, heroism, the requirement of heroism, will continue to play a role in warfare. Officer Statman. So here's one possible view of war. And if there are any non-pacifists in this room, they, they share this view. So the non-pacifists believe that when war breaks out, you can go out there 
and kill all the, guy, the bad guys of the other side, provided they belong to the army of the other side. Okay? The, the enemy, which is the, the, the army that fights against you, all of the soldiers, all of the members of that army are legitimate targets. So to use the, the terms of the, of the chairman, you're allowed to execute each and all of them. To execute each and all of them. You, do, you don't need to, pr- to prove any kind of personal responsibility. There might be 18-year-olds who know nothing, who are bra- brainwashed by their, their, their educators and by, the, by, by their officers. Their causal role in posing the risk to you might be zero. You know that m- m- most, combatant, uh, most combat soldiers don't even fire once. Or the more so would be people who belong to the army but are not in combat units. But you're allowed to target all of them, to execute all of them. Okay? That's strange, isn't it, morally speaking? That's why some people become pacifists. They, they think this is crazy. Now, some people say, well, okay, but that's war. Yeah, that's, that's you know, not really an answer. There's no magic going on. It's not that you define it as a, as a war and suddenly all these human beings become legitimate targets, and you can just kill them. They're fair game. So one way to justify this mass killing, which again is legitimate both legally and morally, is to say that since they belong to a collective that is posing a serious, very serious, unjust threat to yourself, you're allowed to defend yourself by killing the bad guys. All of them are part of this, of creating this collective threat upon you. That's why you're allowed to kill each of them, even though their individual responsibility, again, and then the individual cause of contribution might be very low. Now, what's this terrible threat? At times, it's no more than violation of your sovereignty, okay? They, they, some, some neighboring country invades your territory because they, they fancy some of your territory. That's all. They're not about, it's not about genocide. But still, according to international law and common sense morality, the invaded country is allowed to take arms and kill all those members of the enemy's army, right? Okay. So those of you who accept that argument, that is, those of you who are not pacifists, would find it very easy to understand how, when the threat is much more serious, when you have... Um, aircraft crashing in buildings in New York or any other serious threats actually killing hundreds of thousands of your citizens that's a real threat. It's not only the threat of those people killed. It's a threat to the economy and the the normal life and so on. Then you have a right to self-defense against those who pose the threat. Now you say, okay, but you need to show that those, those who you target are responsible, otherwise it's going to be just execution. Why? Why here, when the enemy is of this worst kind, there's this higher level of proof demanded? Why, when I fight a regular war, I don't need to, 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 to establish personal responsibility or causal contribution, while when, when I fight against Al-Qaeda or Hamas, or Hezbollah, I need to show that each of those targets is responsible, and I need to maybe maybe afford them due process and a, and, and a trial. That's ridiculous. So not only, not only is killing, targeted killing, legitimate, it seems more, from, from a moral point of view, it seems morally better, morally, morally preferable than killing in, in, in regular wars. Now again, some of you might say, if that's the case, let's be pacifists. That's, that's a fair position. But if you're not pacifists, this follows. Ja, aber klar, es ist, weil die Debatte geht, Mr. Münkler, the debate focuses on one important issue. Are we moving towards a situation where we go away from military combat and warfare, or whether we're limiting warfare, whether we're extending it or limiting it. Well, I thought that this argument regarding the classic armies of the states 
and the individual targeting was once again a more precise statement, in other words, of what I described the post-Hegel reversal of things, which is limiting warfare, limiting victims. Once again, you can imagine it as follows. I'm writing a book about World War One. This is why I've got my examples from that. On the first day of the battle at the Somme, the Brits were attacked and they had 30,000 casualties within two hours there. And this was due to the fact that the assault was carried out in a specific way, but it was also due to the fact that the German fighters with automated guns didn't have any problem there. They had their habits, and there's the famous story that they shot a football into no man's land and just uh, ran behind it and carried out this assault in a sports in a sporty manner, etc. So they killed each other in this general way that Hegel described. And under these changing circumstances, this is no longer the case. But here we talk about uh, clear scrutiny and examination of who's responsible and who's competent. Of course, errors may, might occur. There are cognitive deficits. For example, names can be mixed up. Faces can be wrongly scanned, whatever you can imagine. But as a matter of principle, it is a dramatic change as opposed to the general shooting of attacking enemies, enemies with machine guns, for instance, because it's like as if I were the police approaching that person, this particular individual person, and only this person and nobody else. The question of legitimacy, Mr. Fuchs, that you raised confronted us with the problem of Kant, i.e., can I address this problem by defining war in a general way? This would be Kant's perspective. Or would I have to embed war in the historicity of ongoing events, that there are wars before the emergence of state and state wars and post-state wars, and each of these systems forms its own ethics with its own specific legitimacy systems? But then that would mean that it would not make sense to transfer the ethics of knighthood to Frederick II or Marie Theresia or Wilhelm II, but they've got their own ethics systems, which they had. So inversely, this means that the wars of the post-state era of post-heroic societies that form specialist communities of which you don't know whether they are secret services or military or the police, but possibly everything is mingled together. And they wage shadow wars secretly because they don't need to accumulate public reputation and honor. And this is what's interesting. I mean, the figures we deal with in World War One, they want to um, to win orders of merit and uh, awards for waging wars. They don't want to wage any shadow wars, but they want to show off. And this um, and has to be demonstrated that they killed somebody with a name X, Y, Z. And they are praised for it. But now they stay in secret. They stay hidden. They can't get any honor or recognition for it. And they can't openly wear their uniforms or maybe... Um, have a white ring on a tank for an enemy shot. But everything is carried out in a clandestine secret way, which does not mean that this works without ethics. The ethics of the international law officer and the chief commander in the drone control centers is very different. It's an ethics of self-control. So. It is not the joy of just shooting away, firing away, but it is retaining oneself. And asceticism. But doesn't that provide for control, checking, and justification systems? Yes, of course. Well, to take it out of secrecy to parliamentarian control and deliberation. Yes, Mr. Fuchs, parliamentarian control, yes, but with secret committees, rather. 
Well, when it comes to the question as to how this is organized in Germany and in the States, what secret services do, where they access and whether a parliamentary committee or a court has to give approval. But people should ne never speak about it because once it is discussed in public, it is an information f about and for a secretly acting counterpart, an information that the counterpart should not get. So it is a problem. Manning is a problem. And this is a price we have to pay because these wars cannot be waged in that way without waging them in a secret way. And regardless of the fact, post-heroic societies don't want to know anything about it anyway. I think now it's high time to open the discussion. And I am positive that there will be many contributions from the public, from the audience. And somebody raised his hand very early, Michel Kellner, it was, and there are many others. So I'm trying to proceed fairly. In the back, please. OK, you go first, and you go next, Michel. Thank you. My name is Johann Schmidt. I'm the so-called military part at the Institute for Peace, Research, and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. Mr. Fuchs, let me start with your initial statement and question asked to Professor Munkler. And you introduced him in a very good way. You said that the only theorist of war of renown in Germany was Professor Munkler. And you might say, this is something beautiful, Professor Munkler. And it's nice for us, too, because we are allowed to listen to him. But isn't that a huge problem for Germany? I mean, one Professor Munkler, is he sufficient to explain the phenomenon of war to a nation in a scientific way and to its leaders and make it understandable. And this is why I'd like to address my question to Professor Stutman and Professor Krishnan to get a perspective of the US on the one hand and of Israel on the other hand and to ask you how do you look at the German expertise when it comes to war strategy, security policy and military in general? I mean, how do you conceive it? Is it sufficient to you what we have here in Germany? Or would you say Germans don't understand anything of that? And this is why they mix up things, as we've done in the whole discussion. They mix up military operations with secret service operations. The fact that an, uh, an armed drone can be used in military purposes is quite straightforward. But a car can, of course, also be used in military contexts. But this doesn't make it uh, become a military means automatically. So. But, I mean, you cannot just uh, drive around with a drone, can you? Um, well, but an armed drone has the same features. An armed drone that is used by secret services to liquidate persons, something which we think is not um, good in a mor moral sense, but this is not a military operation as such. And this is why we don't discuss it. So the question, once again, what about the American-Israeli perspective? Do you understand the statement made by Mr. Nouri Poor just before that the German army would not need any armed drones at all? Thank you. We're collecting questions. My name is Michael Kellner. I'm a spokesman of the federal working group piece of the Green Party. A question to Mr. Munkler and a comment. Well, the first thing you said was like a promise that technology can save us, that drones can save us and salvation. And now we, we've seen in the past that new technological advances in the military were accompanied by the fact that uh, some people argued that war become more civilian. Um, and was also said for automatic guns and the nuclear bomb, and, but it's proven to be wrong. And I don't know whether this will prove wrong as well, but the empirical evidence we have has demonstrated that we have a high number of collateral damage. And of course, empirical facts are not very precise because many things go on secret. But I mean, the evidence we have don't show it. And it leads to drone operations, leading to a situation where it's no longer Guantanamo being the symbol, or, but the drone, so it backfires. And Professor, you talked about the hoplites and the Greeks as a prerequisite for democratic societies to develop. It's interesting. And you could go on and talk about the Middle Ages and the modern times. and the obligation to serve in the army and democratization. 
But now we get to a point where new technological possibilities allow us that a small group of people could control military force. What does that mean for our society if these technologies evolve further? So this is a question to you as a political theorist, Mr. Munkler, against the backdrop of this antique antiquity um, background you just mentioned. One more question from the audience before we have a second round on the panel with our experts. My name is Juliane Katharina Rautenberg. I'm very sad about the Syrian, Syria conflict, and I have a proposal just as food for thought. Think about the international community, which has enough funds and means. What if the international community evacuated all people who don't want to wage war and the others can just um, sh shoot themselves? Wouldn't that work? Thank you. Now we're moving back in the room and then responses. Short question to Mr. Stackman. I'm pinpointing things now. I mean, what is strange for Heinrich Böll Foundation to be talking about targeted killing and supporting that? I hope I misunderstood you, but maybe at least you can tell me who should select these human targets. Okay, short round of answers on the panel, please. Would you like to start, Mr. Stadtman? Okay, I'll take them in the order they were they were raised. Um, yeah, I was quite surprised that somebody said that the, the German army um, shouldn't develop or doesn't need drones. I mean, I mean, if they want to be out of the game, that's fine. But if they want to remain in the game, so I think it's a very good idea for them to have drones. I mean, if in, if in the future there'll be those old wars, which I also think are, we won't see anymore. So they, they, they definitely would like drones. I mean, if they're, if in some, I don't know, Imagine scenario, Germany is attacked by, by tanks. It would be nice to have these drones taking care of the tanks, right? Um, instead of sending their own troops. And if there's a, some, some non-state actor acting against Germany and police just has no way of neutralizing the threat, I'm sure the Germans would be happy, happy to have drones to help them. Um, so yes, I think it's a good idea. I, I have no idea about... Um, whether German citizens know enough, this is just an, an anecdote I can tell, that uh, I was here in, in Germany for a month in, in the winter, and I took part um, on a different panel in Dresden about the use of drones. And um, after the panel ended, I, I stood there and talked for half an hour with a few German, German officers who happened to be there. And they were complaining about the fact that all the rest of the panelists had no idea of what warfare meant. They, just, they had just come, come back from Afghanistan. And, and they found the, the kind of the, the experts on the panel just detached from reality. But I'm not sure whether this re represents anything. Um, regarding collateral damage, um, as far as I know, and this is the, the data I have about Israel, the situation has improved tremendously. I mean, th there's nothing to compare. I think they, according to some publications, the, the ratio now is um, um, one... Um, one civilian killed for every 20 or 30 terrorists. I mean, and also you can, you can understand this by, by simple logic. The, the, these weapons are far more precise, so you can, you can reduce the collateral damage very significantly. And also I think with enough, enough experience, both by the use of drones by Israel and by the U.S., to, to, to see that the fears about misuse and abuse of the, these, these tools were premature. I mean, uh, both in Israel and, and in the U.S., to use weapons or tools, um, drones or other weapons to carry out targeted killing, you need some time the president himself or herself to approve of it. And it's, it's, it's far more demanding in terms of approval of your superiors than just killing Ten, tens or thousands of people in a regular war where you are, as a, as a, you know, a very a, a, um, low-ranked officer can make that decision. So um, I think it's carried out with a lot of caution and the collateral damage is, is reduced significantly. Um, regarding targeted killing and the, the Bell Foundation, um, 
Yeah, I guess you should blame those who invited me. But let me just return the question. I'm assuming you're not a pacifist, because if, if you are a pacifist, you shouldn't be here. I mean, no offense. I'm saying that because for pacifists, all the questions we're talking here is a non-starter. I mean, after all, for pacifists, it's not only drones we shouldn't use. We shouldn't use regular guns. We shouldn't use anything, right? Wars are out of question for pacifists. So those who sit here and are interested in the discussion assume that in principle, wars might be okay, morally justified, and some ways of fighting are morally okay, but they seem to think that these new technologies pose some special problem. So I return the question and say, so you, th you tend to think that t targeted killing is, is terrible. So I ask again, who exactly approves of the mass killing, not targeting, the mass killing in regular wars? Answer, answer, nobody. The, politi the political um, leaders say to the, to the army, okay, you're, you're, you can go now, operate against the enemy, and then the army officers give their instructions, their commands, and the soldiers go out to the battlefield and kill whoever they think they should kill at the other side. Okay, sometimes it's by just, you know, shooting um, cannons or whatever artillery. And sometimes with, with snipers or precise guns, they, they shoot at enemy soldiers. They see them and they kill them. Each one of them well, in, during their attack. Okay. Okay, it's all gekommen. Short, short answer, please. Is, is all gekommen. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not making myself clear. Once you answer, I mean, the question is, of course, a, a moral question, right? You, you, you're meaning to ask who has the moral authority. It's also legal. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. Forget about the, the law for, for a minute. We, we, no, there's going to be a panel tomorrow about the, the legal issues. I'm nothing, I've, I've nothing to say about that right now. I'm talking about the, the moral perspective. The, there might be some legal constraints, okay? So I think the, the force of your challenge is not for me to tell you that, as a matter of fact, in this country or that country, it's the prime minister or the president or the chief of staff. That's not the question. I think the force of the question is, who the hell has the moral authority to determine who would be killed? And if that's the question, I'm just returning it back to you and I'm asking you, who has the moral authority to make... These, to give these instructions in a regular war. A, a, a soldier go to, goes to the, to, the, to the battlefield and kills human beings at the other side, right? He targets and kills them. Who has the authority to make that order, to give that order? Okay. Okay. Probably you don't know how smart the question is that you have posed. Who is entitled to decide? It is really smart because it formulates the price. I mean, I would reformulate it a little bit. The ordinary soldier in a war does not need this decision because everybody who comes to him in an armed way is a legitimate target or has been a legitimate target for the soldier. Now, the transition from a general enemy to a concrete enemy is connected with the fact that somebody has to make a decision. Of course, you have to say we don't want anybody to make a decision because it is terrible. Then you let those enemies go or you try to withdraw. So this development to stem violence has a price, and the price needs to be paid by those who decide. So you don't have the power and help of the machine gun or the heavy artillery. Mrs. Reitenberg, it is very nice to turn right around and say, imagine there is war and nobody goes there, or imagine there is war and everybody uh, goes somewhere else. That was your suggestion, wasn't it? The actors that we are talking about here and that we are focused on don't let you go away because you are an element of their warfare. So you are sort of the coverage. It would exactly be like if they threw away a, a shield. I mean, they need the civil population or society in order to use it as a logistic base 
in order to cover themselves, in order to hide, and in order to produce images of dead children, of dead women, whatever. So they won't let you go. They will include you into their combat activities. Last point. Yes, if groups become smaller and smaller and are less and less able to deal with those or to achieve those effects with huge and big weapon systems. Well, this is the problem of security policy in the 21st century, something that we have to figure out. And possibly it is exactly the question which provokes the answer, saying, OK, then we need to find those few. We have to target or detect those few. We have to identify them in a reliable way and either detain them, if possible, if we have police access on this territory, or together with other states, cooperate with them that they detain them. And if that is not the case, then use those new systems in order to kill them. So the question sort of dramatizes the problem in a way that you have to say, OK, thank goodness the drone is the solution in certain cases. Question whether Germans understand warfare or not. I think there is a cultural issue here. <clears throat> the German constitution says that Germany raises forces for defense. And uh, luckily we weren't in a situation where we had to defend ourselves for a very long time. So <clears throat> the German public uh, wonders... Why do we need to get involved in conflicts around the world? And what kind of tools do we need to fulfill that role of defending our country? Um, whether or not the Bundeswehr needs drones, uh, <laughs> well, I think it makes sense to buy armed drones. Uh, and in the long term, I don't see a bright future for manned fighter aircraft. I think it's cheaper, it's better, it's more effective, it makes more sense to have armed drones to carry out certain roles. Uh, one of those roles is, unfortunately, targeted killing. I don't say that targeted killing is always wrong. I say it, it can be wrong if the wrong people are targeted for the wrong reasons. And we cannot be sure that uh, we kill the, the bad guys if we don't have effective mechanisms of democratic oversight and accountability. And those mechanisms do not exist also in the American system. They do not exist. So even if some senators and uh, congressmen are, uh, are read into targeting lists and procedures, uh, and there is no public accountability overall. Uh, so, so I think that is a big problem. Concerning the question about collateral damage, well, I tend to agree that um, modern warfare or the, the way contemporary wars are conducted have a minuscule number of casualties or, or, or deaths compared to the mass slaughters of the First World War or the Second World War, uh, we can be very happy about that. So that is certainly some sort of progress we've made. However, <clears throat> no, it, it, it is not sarcastic. It, it is not sarcastic. Oh. So... <clears throat> So you also have to consider that the number of people killed by terrorists is also minuscule. So the Heritage Foundation conducted a study about uh, domestic terrorism deaths in the United States over the last 40 years. It's 5,600. And overall, um, I mean, that includes 9-11, by the way. Overall, the number of people who drown in their bathtubs uh, is higher. The number of people who die from bee stings is higher. The number of people who get accidentally shot by the police is higher. So we need to consider the proportionality of the threat here. The f terrorism threat domestically in the West isn't that high. I don't say that other countries don't have a high terrorism threat. Uh, and Israel is a different matter altogether. Uh, Pakistan is a different matter. Iraq is a different matter. But here in the West, we have to consider uh, the uh, fundamentalist uh, militia guy in Pakistan is not a threat to us or in Yemen, is not a threat to us. <clears throat> At least not such a high threat overall. Uh, concerning uh, uh, the, the, the war in Syria, well, I think the war in Syria is a proxy war. 
It, it's not so much about the internal causes here. It's about, uh, well, Assad gets propped up by Iran and Russia, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the U.S. and Israel trying to overthrow him. So it's a proxy war. It's not so much about the internal situation as such, and there are external interests at stake. And uh, the final comment about who decides who to kill. I think that's an extremely important question, and it has to do with uh, democratic accountability, which, I said, is lacking. And there's a big debate in the United States about whether or not the, uh, uh, the U.S. president has the authority to order the killing of a U.S. citizen, possibly even on U.S. soil. And, <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, after years of dodging the question, um, Eric Holder finally admitted, yes, uh, they believe that in principle we have the authority to kill American citizens, if necessary, on U.S. soil. Uh, so, so I find that highly problematic from the perspective of democracy. So <laughs> getting back to the point, uh, points made by Professor Munkler about the connection of uh, weapons technology and uh, d democracy and that this can be very positive, I think it's the opposite with the new types of weapons uh, and surveillance technologies we have. I think democracy is at, uh, is at risk here, is threatened by new technologies, not only drones, uh, but also directed energy weapons. And if you can target all the people you don't like without ever being held accountable for that, uh, and it, it cannot be good for democracy. Vielen Dank. Wir kommen jetzt nochmal zu einer zweiten. Okay, thank you very much. We are now coming to the second round. At least four guests are claiming the floor, so you please start. All of you. We can share the microphone. Uh, I, thank you, first of all, thank you for a very excellent and diverse panel and a really good range of discussions. I find myself very much in agreement with Amon's uh, views, and so I'm not going to ask you a question. I want to direct my question at Professor Statman. Is that the correct pronunciation? Um, you said, well, you said yourself that in, in a war, you can execute everyone, is what is to put it, the way you put it. It's not quite true, because there are people who are hors de combat, you know, the, 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 even among combatants, there are mentally ill soldiers, surrendering soldiers and things. So, But you were just trying to go for dramatic effect there. But what my question really is about your idea about the extra burden of proof required to kill somebody from Al-Qaeda. Um, now, if someone flies a plane into the Twin Towers... Um, Obviously, they're all dead because they've flown the plane into the Twin Towers. The citizens of Al... It's not a state actor. Who are they? There are Germans involved. As we know, there are American citizens. There are French involved. There certainly are UK citizens. So if we don't have... In a, in a normal warfare, the combatants are easily identifiable. They're wearing uniforms. In a kind of war like this, they're not. They're citizens from all over the world. They don't have a particular state. So... Would you then want to execute all the people of the world? Please. Uh, uh, Jürgen Altmann, Physiker and Friedrich. Jürgen Altmann, physicist and peace researcher at the University of Dortmund. Now, if it was true that old wars do no longer take place and will no longer take place, and you, Mr. Munkler, practically said that. We will only have those mini wars in the future. Then I don't really understand why we still have air carriers and nuclear bombers and armored defense vehicles and armed helicopters. If you have a look at the numbers, then this should all be eliminated. Then these things should be eliminated. And then every country should get 500 drones and then you're done. The big risk that I see is that the states will still use their armies and soldiers to prepare themselves to another big war, let's say between China and the United States, can also be India versus Pakistan. And if drones are added as an additional instrument, then we have a different scenario. For instance, the question of instability between two drone fleets that threat each other, where you do not have time for three days to survey a house, but where you have to shoot within milliseconds or shoot back. 
Thank you. Wolfgang Richter. I have already introduced myself. My first question goes to Mr. Münkler. First of all, I have to say that I subscribe to many things that you said regarding the ethics of post-heroic societies. My question is similar to Mr. Altman's questions. Why are you so sure that in the future we will no longer see state against state wars, but only asymmetrical wars? using high-tech instruments and weapons. If I recall it correctly, then the asymmetrical war since the time of colonial wars has always been with us. It took place in the hinterland of major, on major fronts of the big wars. It is not a new phenomenon. And especially the United States has a huge stock of historic experiences in covert wars below the official war thresholds, both in countries of the third world and also in areas that are closer to them. I'm not going to delve into detail here. Against that backdrop, you, of course, has to have to ask yourself, Why do we have this armament spiral? Why are those states still equipping themselves? Those wars will probably not take place here in Europe, maybe in Asia, East Asia. And even in Europe, we it is not that long ago that we have had wars. You played down the Georgia war. It was a five-day war, a very classical war. Kosovo war is not that long ago either. And also the Iraq war. So historically speaking, we are talking about very short periods. So I'm not really sure. We maybe also have to say that heroic and post-heroic societies are developing in parallel, like you have said. And I'm not only talking about armed NGOs. I'm also talking about the identity and self-understanding of other states outside of Western communities. This could be a problem for your hypothesis. Second question. Okay, if we say, and this is how you can interpret it, that targeted killing had something to do with the limitation of usually unlimited wars, then you can also say that or put that differently. If you target individuals outside of a legal framework, and we have the Human Rights Pact on the one hand and humanitarian international law in international non-armed conflicts, for instance, on the other, then you also put limits to the world of states and international law. I mean, other countries could come up with similar ideas. China, for instance, uh, targets resistance fighters in the US or whatever. And you could think of all kinds of different scenarios. What does that mean for international law at the end of the day? What does that mean if you act in states that are currently weak? But what happens if they counter-strike someday? So if you limit yourself to individuals, there could be a problem for international law and that have, could have detrimental implications on the coexistence of states. Thank you very much for your interesting contribution. My name is Mona Goertz. I'm a peace consultant. I have to say that I have understood that you are taking stock here. We have heard different explanations why warfare is as it is. From a security policy perspective, it seems to be the right thing, what we do at the moment, and it seems that the technologies are the right ones. From a sociology point of view, we heard why we act like we act. But what is sort of missing in our discussion here, especially as regards the ethics question, Are those developments really desirable? What do they do with us? What do those developments do with others that we target, both emotionally speaking and rationally speaking? Okay, thank you. Last question in the front here. Um, when I read the description of this conference and I listened to the panels and, and saw the panelists, I thought there was two big questions. One is, what does the future of warfare and conflict look like And how do the German people and the German state fit into this evolving future? That was just my interpretation of the event. So far, we've heard talk about targeted, drone, targeted killings, drones, automaticity, post-heroic warfare, and so forth. My question to the panel is, what do you see the driving forces in the future of warfare and how it evolves, and what the German people as a whole, sh what role they should play? And, and my, my answer, just to provoke you a little, is it's not about targeted killings. It's not about robots or aut automatic killings or heroic war. 
it's about the fact that we're an information society in a changing economic and technological base of information that is changing almost all social interactions, and in particular warfare. And, and a lot of the questions we re, we've talked about so far today have to do with who knows what about whom and then who does it. And this crosses domestic, it crosses domestic international, it crosses German, Russian. And I just wanted to, if you can talk about what you see as the drivers for this future of war and how Germany should fit itself into this, this conflict-ridden world. Thank you very much. So we will have another round here on the panel. And let's see how much oxygen we have here to answer those questions. Would you like to start, Mr. Krishnan? Well, concerning the last point of how I see the future of war and how the German society or German military fits into that. Well, I mean, what are, will be the objectives for war? And one major objective that is currently prevalent is um, fighting non-state actors, in particular Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups around the globe. The other major interest that is pursued is reshaping the world order uh, and <clears throat> yeah, potentially gaining a foothold in other parts of the world, securing resources against other emerging powers, such as China in particular. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, um, that uh, the main objective uh, for warfare in, in the future will remain geopolitical, but the, the way these objectives will be achieved will be more covert. It's no longer being done openly in open military intervention, as has been done in the past, I mean, that is getting very expensive. Uh, it's uh, no longer feasible in, uh, for many reasons. Uh, so, so you want to do that covertly. Uh, cyberspace. cyberspace definitely will play uh, a role in that, but I don't think that uh, the threat of cyber war is that serious. Uh, and uh, most of, of the, the most important aspect of cyber war is currently cyber espionage. Uh, and uh, cyber sabotage, cyber subversion, it's not really war, but uh, it can, can be potentially in the future. So, <clears throat> so how does uh, Germany fit into that? Uh, well, um, Germany doesn't have really global interests, such uh, as is the case with the United States. So our interests are much more limited. Uh, however, we are also part of NATO, so Germany has to try to fit into the overall objectives of NATO and play uh, a relevant role in, in that. Uh, and this means also taking responsibility in the military and security uh, domain. But I don't think that uh, Germany has any interest or capability of leading in, in, in that field. So, so we will go along with what the United States and other NATO partners want us to do for the most Thanks. part. Vielen Dank. Herr Münkler, das waren ja ein paar sehr fundamental. Thank you, Mr. Münkler. These have been some fundamental questions addressed to you. Let me start with a few remarks on the German society. So in principle, there are two ways of reacting. We are not a heroic society, but we do have mechanisms to react, which is called indifference. You talked about how much higher the figures of killed persons in individual traffic are or by infections, what have you. So we do know that we run a high risk when we um, are traffic participants. And I call this muric indifference. And in my well, in the region where I come from, um, we would call this, well, we don't really care, and this is how we can cope with the situation in a post-heroic society. So the more, dif in, the more indifference you have, the weaker the attack has become. And this is what the difference is towards other types of threats, because the decisive effect that they reach are waves of emotional excitement or arousal that 
emerge in these societies, the implications of which are way stronger than immediate physical damage. Another form to respond to this vulnerability in cyber wars mentioned, it is creating reserves. Reserves cost money. So in at the time of lean production and of rationalizing everything, societies will win benefits when they produce for less money, but they become vulnerable and they become dependent on control systems so that we have to say, well, nothing must go wrong. And societies that f follow this principle invite players to make it go wrong where nothing must go wrong. And this is quite straightforward because if they didn't, they'd be dumb and stupid. So we have to think about what economic benefits can be dispensed with in order not to create this vulnerability that will then, in a higher degree, create waves of arousal in uh, the population to call for counterattacks. So these are types of prevention that are being discussed and that are worked on, but they are very differentiated. They don't only concern terrorists that do this deliberately, but they concern situations where, for instance, a ship leaves a shipyard and you lift cables and the, the currencies uh, the current supply, the electricity supply breaks down. But you addressed one question directly to me. I mean, I've been talking about body politic for a long time. It's the emergence of the creation of vulnerability in relation to vulnerance, which creates relatively stable systems in principle. So in retrospective, we might say, well, but this was playing with fire, what we experienced in the Cold War. But in principle, it worked. There were points in time where we were quite close to an escalation, but it worked surprisingly well. So my trust in the disappearance of this type of war, which will no longer be dominant enough to mark European history like in the first half of the 20th century, my trust is due to the high vulnerability of industrial societies. So the capacity to wage war of 1940 was based on the fact that they had agrarian agricultural societies, and agricultural societies are less vulnerable than industrial societies, and so on and so forth. You can even calculate this. So it goes without saying that you cannot guarantee that things won't escalate, but the probability gets less. And as opposed to 1914, we've got a wealth of communication systems, trust building measures, OECD and others that are trying to keep that risk low. But still, some residuals remain. And this is the problem of hostility. When Excluding and ruling out hostility as such, we must not even think about asymmetrical and symmetrical wars. And I've been reflecting upon this a lot. And um, I'm not naive enough to believe that asymmetry is something new. The conflict between Sparta and Athens in the 5th century before Christ was a deeply asymmetrical war where Pericles said, we will make Spartans fail because they're used to fight against men, but now they're going to fight against ships and money. But at the end, this um, reasoning did not work out, but it's an asymmetrical strategy. The confrontation of sea powers and land powers is asymmetrical. In brief, in contrast to the suggestion when Alpha Primitivum said non-symmetric, symmetry is the exception in history, and asymmetry is what can be expected. So there have always been regimes that have created symmetry with a number of benefits. So at the times of knighthood, it was the question of honor and the accumulation of possessions, etc. And in states, it was the fact that only those who built up armies within, or could stay within the circle of um, big powers. 
and so on. So these are highly complex systems. And when I'm saying that asymmetry is the threat, then this is the case because they don't follow the same logics and the same value systems. So we have a hard time identifying with the other side and putting ourselves in their shoes. So it was still easy when the red tanks were opposed against the blue tanks and the red cannons against the blue cannons and it was still easy because then you could add and deduct quantities. But you cannot oppose strike drones against suicide bombers following the logics of the statistics of the past that I just outlined. But these are dark and non-predictable threats that can't be gauged. It's the known unknown, which is the actual threat of security architectures. Thank you, Professor Stepman. So I, I meant it to be dramatic. So don't, don't draw the drama. Um, so let me just repeat the drama. Um, this is how I usually open my first class on I have a seminar on the ethics of war, so that's how I open the class. And if you forget, don't remember anything of what I said today, try to remember this puzzle. It's really puzzling. And this is the puzzle. In the domestic context, context, there are very serious constraints on the use of force, definitely lethal force, okay? Um, in order for somebody to be, to have a right to use lethal force against another human being, it's a very serious issue and in most countries um, there's no capital punishment because we think that human, human life is sacred and so on okay? and we, we have these very high words about the, the value of each individual life etc etc and then all of a sudden your country declares war and all of a sudden, the entire moral landscape is transformed. Well, just, you know, the day before that, or actually the same day within your own country, you still have those very serious constraints on the use of lethal force. When it regards human beings, human beings on the other side, you can kill almost all of them. Of course, I didn't mean POWs. You, almost all of them. That's real, you know, mind-boggling. How could this be possible, morally speaking? And that's the big challenge of moral philosophy today, talking about war. How could this be ju ever justified? So, so here's, again, one way to think about that. And I think this way it has, has its problems. I, don't have I won't be able to talk about the problems, but it has a great appeal, and the appeal has to do with respect for dignity. And this is how it goes. When you kill somebody, just because that somebody is part of the enemy, you deny the fact that the person is an individual. The person isn't just, you know, a part of that collective. It's a person with a family, with a name, and so on. So what happens in individual self-defense? You're, you're allowed to defend yourself using lethal force only against somebody who poses an immediate threat against you and there's no other way to protect yourself, etc., etc. So in principle, war is a collective enterprise of self-defense. It's a group of people defending themselves from another group of people. But if this is to be justified morally, then ultimately it needs to rely on assumptions about moral responsibility and causal involvement of the people you kill on the other side. Okay, in order not to dehumanize the people of the other side, you, you need to assume that the, the people you are killing, namely the, com the enemy combatants, have some responsibility for the threat their, their collective is posing and in some way are morally responsible for that. Okay, if you buy into that kind of explanation and if, if you don't, so again, it's very hard to understand how this very wide permission, blanket permission to kill, is, 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 is um, justified. So if you buy into th that kind of explanation, so the same argument would apply to non-state collectives too. So here too, the reason you're killing the Al-Qaeda guys 
is that Al Qaeda, as a group, is posing a very serious threat, and those people you're killing, you have some grounds to assume that they are a morally responsible for their involvement in the posing of this threat, and also are causally involved in the posing of the threat. Now, then there's a question of the exact ad- identification, but here we should be very careful. I mean, one way to understand the challenge is to say, to understand these things when they like this. Since we cannot identify them, therefore, you can't kill them unless you bring them to trial, to court. That's one way to understand the challenge. Another way would be, yeah, in principle, it's okay to kill the bad guys, namely the Al-Qaeda guys, And it's more okay to kill them than to kill 18-year-old soldiers. And why is it more okay? Because usually, typically, Al-Qaeda members are are more grown up, are are more... Their their joining of Al-Qaeda is more autonomous than 18-year-old. Okay, they are more morally responsible. Therefore, it's respect to them, to their autonomy when you you target them. So, it is... Um, maybe harder to identify them, but definitely not impossible. I mean, we have good intelligence. And in fact, in the case of Israel, there's a, a one human rights association called Betzelem, which has been active a lot, uh, many years against the occupation, and is very critical of Israel, and also about against Israel's policy of targeted killing. But they concede that the direct targets that Israel has targeted within this policy are indeed terrorists. They say that still you, there's no due process, there's a problem of collateral damage, but there's no dispute that in all of, the, the majority of the cases, the, the people actually targeted are Hamas members. Um, so I don't see this problem as, as, as critical. Um, okay. Good. Vielen Dank. Um, Thank you. All right. So at this point, we would like to close the session for tonight. And I'd like to ask you to bear with me for two housekeeping remarks. One thing is that I'm sorry, and I'd like to extend my apologies for the person who asked about who decided about targeted killings, left the room. But I'd like to explicitly say what is part of our culture So first, I thought the question was more than justified. And second, there is no stupid question. There is just stupid answers. Second remark. It refers to a more basic problem, and you can feel it all over the debate. So we're moving on in solid grounds, and we might say in the language of military, that we are on mined territory. And for us, it's always a difficult and thin line that we walk on to say, how far are we following these discussions that don't say in general, we reject all of that, we don't accept it, we are against war anyway, we're against violence, so we don't even talk about these things. This is a legitimate position, but this way of pacifist innocence is something that I and that the Greens have lost or lost a long time ago for good reasons, I might say, which means that we're trying to deal with a subject matter that first seems completely foreign and alien to us. Most of us refused to join the army and we emanated and emerged from the peace movement, the movement against missile armament and nuclear war. And now we are discussing new and recent developments in military technology. And we're trying to understand first what's going on and how does that change future warfare and how does it change the options chosen by policymakers, and we're trying to get an ethical, political, and international law assessment of these developments to derive from that a clear political position. And I think it's a difficult, thin line to walk on, but at the same time, it's indispensable to undergo this process, because otherwise we would end up in a position 
of not being able to judge anymore and of not being able to be active in policy making and discussing about these things does not mean mm -hmm. agreeing with them and legitimizing them but first and foremost it means for the time being to form a position to make up one's mind to form an attitude and this is the intention that's behind this conference and I do hope dearly that and this is probably why you've come here that you will join us on this complicated journey thank you so much for that now we're going to have a reception with some snacks and drinks and tomorrow morning we would like to resume at nine in the morning and I hope that many of you will return and thanks to the interpreters and thanks to the panelists.